Okay, next up is going to be John Nolan. Um, he is a member of the principal professional staff at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. His work involves the design and running of seminars, workshops, and studies addressing problems in concept development, systems requirements, and systems analysis. His most recent efforts have addressed topics in cybersecurity, Arctic intelligence requirements, and technology development. Prior to joining the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, uh, Mr. Nolan was a career Army officer. He has served in units in Europe, Korea, and the United States. He taught European and military history at West Point. He served in a variety of operations and plans positions in U.S. Army, Europe, and NATO Central Army Group. His education, he's a West Point grad, his graduate degrees in European history from Stanford, and a master's in business administration from Johns Hopkins, and he is a graduate of the Armed Forces Staff College. John. Thank you. I would like to echo the comments of the other speakers, uh, saying what a pleasure it is to be here today. I would also like to thank my colleague, Duncan Brown, for conning me into doing this. Uh, he represented that it would be a small, intimate group. I've forgotten what the definition of a small, intimate group is in the Army, so nevertheless. Uh, my job today is to offer some historical perspectives on innovation in the Army. I plan to do that in three parts. Uh, first, I want to give uh, sort of a whirlwind tour of military history and some history of innovation. And then I want to focus on the United States Army, specifically in the years 1973 to 1991. And then uh, I want to try and wrap it up and draw some parallels between the Army of those years, the Army of today, some of the recurring and some of the new challenges that await us. Uh, there's an old adage that uh, history is written by the winners. I don't believe that's entirely true. Uh, however, military history tends to emphasize the winners, and I would say that those winners are often innovators. Uh, the clearest examples of innovation, I think, are in the areas of weaponry and technology. It's uh, physics-based. The effects are fairly obvious. Uh, you can see these things in uh, museums all over the world, but I think it's important to emphasize that there are many other forms of innovation, and hopefully you'll see some examples today. This is a very simplified chart of innovations in weapons and technology going from the time of the Romans to modern tanks and aircraft. The general trend is uh, greater range, greater lethality, greater accuracy. Uh, in terms of uh, technologies, I, I show there railroads and telegraph. These were technologies, civilian technologies, adapted by uh, the armies of the day to, uh, to move armies with greater speed, to sustain them more efficiently. Telegraph, of course, uh, uh, provided the ability to better command and control them. Uh, this, this is also a trend, I think, in technology. But uh, armies are more than technologies. They're also manned by people. And I would say that how armies are manned and organized enable and amplify the innovations in weapons and technology. I'm going to jump in the interest of time to the mid-18th century. I show two examples. Uh, driven by gunpowder weapons, uh, most European armies in the mid-18th century were using muzzle-loaded smoothbore muskets. Uh, very lethal, very inaccurate. Uh, they found that there was a premium in having drill soldiers, soldiers who would stay in ranks, follow close order drill, move to very close ranges, fire in volleys, load on command, fire again. Very lethal, and the armies that perhaps best personified this approach was the Prussian army of the mid-18th century. However, things would change by the end of that century. The French Revolution had occurred, and the French showed that they had a new nation state, a revolutionary France, that could both encourage its citizens and better coerce them to fill the ranks. And so they created this levee en masse, uh, which brought more citizen soldiers. What they lacked in drill and discipline, they more than made up for in numbers and in spirit and ferocity. However, uh, organizations are not the only enablers or amplifiers. Uh, generalship also played a role here. And so for the two examples I've given, the Prussian army and the French army, I obviously am going to highlight Frederick the Great, whose innovations in tactics, notably uh, the attack in the bleak order, uh, made Prussia far more powerful beyond its actual strategic capabilities uh, there in the center of Europe. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, of course, uh, amplified the levee en masse of revolutionary armies of France through his own innovations in strategic and tactical maneuver. Indeed, historians 
soldiers, theorists would spend most of the 19th century trying to analyze and replicate Napoleon's genius on the battlefield. However, we should note that warfare was changing in the 19th century. The arrival of railroads and telegraph, as I spoke of before, uh, increased the ability of armies to be moved, supplied. Uh, the telegraph helped in coordination of them. Conscription now applied elsewhere, uh, built bigger armies, and I think two generals who uh, epitomized the Union Army at the end of that Civil War, Grant and Sherman, fully understood uh, the impact of these two trends. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Europeans had their own innovations. Uh, they recognized the power of railroads and telegraph. They also recognized that conscription was here to stay, and they implemented peacetime conscription. This gave them much larger armies. And then they further innovated with the idea of reserve service for conscriptions. So now we had conscripts filling the standing army and then continued service in reserves. Through the use of railroads and telegraph, these armies could be quickly mobilized, assembled, and set in motion to execute a very complicated war plan. This went well beyond the genius of an individual Napoleon. It required another innovation, and that was the general staff. Uh, von Molke, the elder from Prussia, uh, started the German general staff, or at least he's given credit for that. But his success in, in wars against uh, Austria and France caused the general staff system to be replicated throughout Europe. Now, machine guns, new weaponry added to the lethality of armies, reserve and mobilization system added to their size and flexibility, the general staff uh, added to their, their command and control. We know that these great armies first uh, arrived in a horrific conflict in 1914 in the First World War. Uh, we know that the Western Front soon lapsed into stalemate for a variety of reasons, the strength of the defense so much greater than the strength of the offense. Innovation did not die. Innovation, on the contrary, was further stimulated by the need to break this uh, stalemate on the Western Front. And so we see the uh, innovations in tanks, aircraft, and while most of us don't like to think of it, poison gas was also an innovation, not a particularly successful one. There were also innovations in tactics. You notice that armies also have to be manned by more than just the fighters. There's a great reliance on mechanics and technicians to deliver these new capabilities to the armies. Now, World War I was ultimately decided, I, th I think it's safe to say, by strategic exhaustion by the Germans. But it's, it's clear that innovation was still uh, operating in, in, the sec in the First World War. The people who learned the most from the First World War uh, were, of course, the Germans. Uh, they recognized the value of tanks and aircraft, and they uh, developed uh, a system of employing those. Uh, we should recognize that tanks, aircraft, and, and uh, other things were available elsewhere. The theories of uh, armored warfare were actually developed elsewhere, but it was the Germans who imposed a doctrine, at least in their armored force, that emphasized uh, mobility and individual initiative, and this doctrine was instilled up and down the chain of the, uh, of the armored force. And so they invented this thing called Blitzkrieg, uh, which we all know uh, led to very early German victories. It was only because the Allies survived long enough to adopt these same methods with greater strategic uh, resources that uh, the Germans were defeated in Blitzkrieg. I should note that the, this rapid tour should also uh, emphasize that uh, external events would both influence and be influenced by these innovations. Uh, the Prussian army was a product of the centralized state. The centralized state was a product of the Prussian army. Uh, the French Revolution uh, made possible the social changes and the political changes that allowed the levee en masse and al allowed an uh, obscure Corsican artillery officer to become the emperor of France. Uh, nationalism and industrialization allowed the creation of these great armies by the end of the 19th century. And I think it should be noted that Blitzkrieg was made possible as much by Nazi strategic ambition as it was by armored theorists. So there are external factors that influence these things. Uh, I should also like to note the downside of innovation. One of the keys to uh, German Blitzkrieg doctrine was rapid, secure communication. To do that, they had this marvelous innovation known as the Enigma coding machine. It was actually an application of commercial cryptography. Uh, it proved to be the Achilles heel of the German war effort. It was one innovation too many. The Allies broke the codes, read the mail, 
and created their own system for protecting this great secret and disseminating its treasure, which we could also see as innovations. Uh, thoughts on innovation in general terms, uh, it comes in many forms. I've outlined basically weapons, technology, manning, organization, generalship, and doctrine. Uh, and it is influenced and influences external factors. Uh, I believe historically as, as militaries become more complex, it's the combination, the integration, the coordination of these innovations that becomes extremely important. I'd like to turn now to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. Army 1973 to 1991. I chose 1973 because it was a very pivotal year in Army history, U.S. Army history. Uh, the signing of the Paris Peace Accords, the withdrawal of U.S. military involvement in Vietnam. It was also the year of the Volunteer Army. The last draftees were called up in June of 1973. From then on, we were reliant upon this marvelous new thing called the All-Volunteer Force, and there were many skeptics. Uh, the Army was an army in crisis. Actually, there's a book of that title, I believe, published in 1971. 71 was actually a tougher year for the Army, probably, than 73. Uh, this was a time when we had budget cuts. Uh, I can tell you that uh, there were many officers, OCS commissioned officers, to fill the needs of the Vietnam Army who were reduced in force, uh, either given the option to become enlisted men again or to lead the service, and many of them did. Uh, the Army had many scandals in 73 and the years prior. Uh, the ranks had a lot of drug abuse, racial turmoil, and uh, many discipline problems. I should note that there was one other uh, less than substantial historical event in 1973. That's the year I was commissioned in the infantry. Uh, despite my appearance in 1973, the Army still had some problems. Uh, 1991 uh, was Operation Desert Storm, and uh, we'll get there. Uh, using the same paradigm I used uh, looking at military history, I, I think it's useful to first look at manning and organization, because that's really where the Army's biggest challenges were. We had to now create an enlisted force based on volunteerism as opposed to the selectivity of the draft. So we had to come up with incentives to recruit, to get the kinds of recruits we wanted. We focused on high school graduates. We offered bonuses. Uh, at one time, a high school graduate with the right tickets could get a $4,000 bonus just for enlisting in the infantry. That was not the way it was in Vietnam, but it would be in this new all-volunteer force. There was a lot of adjustment. Recruiting Command was a very important organization. We also came up with ways to separate from the service those who really shouldn't have been in the service. Uh, the NCO Corps uh, was challenged post-Vietnam. It got a lot of criticism. It had been through a lot of uh, war years. Uh, the new volunteer force was perceived as an undermining of NCO authority. Uh, and so efforts were made to try and improve the NCO Corps. As you can see from the list there, an evaluation system that influenced promotions, emphasis on NCO academies. And I think one of the best decisions the Army made was to emphasize the role of the command sergeant major. Let me be clear, this was not unanimous among, among uh, many in the Army in those years. It proved to be an excellent decision. Uh, command sergeant majors at every level, the emphasis on new responsibilities and new roles, and the effort to improve the quality of the NCO Corps. I think history has proved it to be a very wise decision. The officer corps, one of the uh, key decisions made was command selection. Uh, centralized command selection so the battalion and brigade commanders were selected based on centralized boards and not just the availability of a lieutenant colonel on post to take the battalion down the street. It was, uh, it was managed from the highest level. Uh, a few other points, education and emphasis on practical company commander level uh, skills were taught in the, in the advanced courses. Every uh, field grade officer was expected to complete command and general staff college either in residence or by correspondence. And finally on this slide, uh, new organizations. Uh, TRADOC was created in 1973 to focus, as its name implies, on training and doctrine. And much of the uh, forces uh, management and control was shifted over to a new headquarters called ForceCom. There was also now an emphasis on division and core organizations, not just as administrative organizations as they had been in Vietnam, but actual maneuvering warfighting organizations. 
I'd like to turn now to doctrine and training. Uh, a seminal figure in the United States Army at this time was General William Depew. Uh, Depew uh, fought in World War II as a lieutenant in the 90th Infantry Division. He is one of the few to survive that ordeal. He emerged from World War II uh, with the belief that many people did not survive because of a lack of good training and a lack of competent leadership. When he was the commander of the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam, General Depew was notorious for relieving commanders, battalion, uh, and company that he thought were incompetent. Um, Depew came back to the United States to take this command. Actually, he'd been here as the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff before that. Uh, there was a seminal event as well in 1973, and that was the October War between uh, Arab states and Israel that confirmed in Depew's mind uh, two key principles on the modern battlefield. If you can be seen, you can be hit, and if you can be hit, you can be killed. And he started a very conscientious effort to reshape the way the Army trained and the way it prepared for war. One of those examples is uh, shown here, FM 100-5, the 76 version, which was very tactically focused, very firepower focused. Post Depew, uh, TRADOC went through additional uh, work under General Starry and General Otis, and what emerged by 1986 was a more refined version of airland battle and a, a uh, emphasis not just on the first battle at the forward line of battle, but a deep battle that would shape the forward line of battle. Uh, in terms of training, some very important innovations here. Uh, basic skills was emphasized uh, at all the schoolhouses teaching soldiers, re reconfirming that soldiers knew what their basic tasks were and that they could prove that they could do them through the skills qualification test. Uh, I have shown their miles and, and it will be a miracle if I can remember the actual uh, acronym for that, uh, but that was a laser uh, system, multiple integrated laser engagement system. It was a way of fixing lasers onto weapons and getting a much more realistic training at small unit level. Uh, more importantly, and I think uh, I think the vice mentioned it this morning was the use of after action reviews in which leaders and followers were all assembled and critically uh, examined what went right and what went wrong in a small unit engagement. Whether it hurt the leader's feelings or not, uh, it, was a, it was a tough but very useful exercise. The Army expanded this when it created the National Training Center. Again, a, a very important innovation. I was, I was at Fort Irwin in 1980 and saw it stood up. Uh, the effort to instrument uh, the training center so that we had much more objective evaluation of tactics and doctrine and the leaders who were executing them. Uh, the BCTP there refers to a senior level uh, program of evaluating flag officers using retired flag officers. I was certainly never in the room for that, but it would have been fun to watch. Uh, also, in terms of military... Uh, material innovations in this time period, uh, General Creighton Abrams had five high priorities, the big five illustrated here. Uh, each of these weapon systems represents a radical improvement, in my view, over its predecessor, the M1 tank, probably being the best example of a combination of a new engine, uh, new armor, and a very highly accurate gun, which, of course, would, would soon prove, prove its value. Uh, the M2 fighting vehicle had its critics, but as someone who had to work with an M113, uh, I can tell you this had to be a real improvement. Uh, okay, all of these innovations, as I said earlier in my historical uh, run-through, uh, they all are influenced or influence external factors. I think this slide attempts to show that on the far right. Uh, what were the external factors? It was a clear focus on Europe in 1973 and thereafter. Uh, while the U.S. was engaged in South Vietnam, the Soviets had been busy uh, building new, very advanced weaponry, very impressive weaponry, new systems. Uh, through some of their surrogates, they'd been active elsewhere in the world. Uh, it was the United States policy to refocus on Europe and recommit to our NATO commitment. This was also a time of economic recession. The bad news was we got smaller budgets. Uh, the good news was we got some really great people who came into the Army as an economic opportunity. There were social changes in the United States, obviously. Uh, women's role in society was changing, and more and more women came into the ranks for the same reasons. They enlisted for the same reasons that men did. I think it's unlikely the Army would have ever met its recruitment goals 
had it not been for recruiting women in the service. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that domestic politics had a great deal to do with these innovations because it was the money that came from the Reagan buildup that really paid for many of the innovations I've described. Uh, this was, uh, obviously Ronald Reagan was instrumental in pushing this through, but he had a great deal of cooperation or coercion with the United States Congress. Uh, so there was a real floodgate of money that began with the Reagan administration. Goldwater and Nichols, those of you who recall, this was uh, a reform pushed by Congress to make the services more uh, joint and cooperative in nature. They didn't really resolve this by themselves. Congress helped make it a law, and I think that also had a, a severe or a, a very positive impact on uh, this era. And of course, technologies, they've been, uh, they've been covered elsewhere, but lasers, computers, all those other things that were developed uh, found their way into, uh, into the Army. Uh, interesting confluence of events in uh, 1990. Uh, we have Iraq evades Kuwait and some good old-fashioned conquest. Uh, the U.S. Army is emerging from years of reform and transformation. Uh, the Joint Force is working better than ever, and our sister services in the Air Force and the Navy have had their own rejuvenation. And this is an international environment where the Soviet Union is crumbled, and they're actually cooperating, and there's a a convergence of interests that forms a grand coalition of NATO, the Gulf states, Syria, and Egypt fought uh, in that coalition as well. Uh, we won. I'm not going to give you a, a history of uh, the Persian Gulf War. Most of you are familiar with it. This is a marvelous quote by uh, uh, Barry McCaffrey, who was commanding the 24th Infantry Division. This war didn't take 100 hours to win. It took 15 years. If you're looking for an excellent source on it, uh, of course, certain victory uh, compiled by uh, Robert Scales is an excellent source. There's a few good, uh, it starts out with a few good war stories at the beginning. Uh, let me see if I can wrap this up. Uh, perspectives on history and innovation. Uh, there's this marvelous little book called What is History? written by E.H. Carr, British historian. My two favorite quotes, uh, What is History? An unending dialogue between the present and the past. To learn about the present in the light of the past means also to learn about the past in the light of the present. What does that mean? History is not a dead set of facts. It's actually uh, a look not only into the past, but a look into the present. Uh, for example, uh, the United States Army emerged from 1973, uh, somewhat battered from its Vietnam experience. It had to undergo a number of innovations, as I've tried to describe, in manning, organization, doctrine, training, weaponry, etc. And by 1991, it was, a, it was a very potent force and proven on the battlefield. The Army of 2015 is coming home, hopefully, someday soon, from conflicts overseas. It, too, has to look to the future, and innovations must undoubtedly be part of that. Looking at 73, 91, I think there's some things to be learned that give us a better understanding of the task ahead. And I would say that if... Uh, General Perkins looks at General Depew, he'll probably have a new appreciation of the challenges that Depew had and a better understanding of that era based on the same challenges he has now. Uh, comparison of the two armies, there are differences. I think the Army uh, is emerging in 2015 a much better force, much better shaped force than the one in, in 73 for a variety of reasons. Uh, it enjoys great prestige and popularity in the country. It's perceived as superior to any nearly any other army I can think of, certainly if not in quality, then certainly size and quality. It's a, it's a splendid force. Uh, the Army of 73 had one advantage. We had a clear focus on Europe and a clear focus on our potential adversaries. It would either be the Soviets or probably more likely, and in fact it was the case, Soviet equipped forces using Soviet tactics. The Army of 2015 really doesn't know with the same clarity. Uh, for all the reasons, all the descriptions earlier today, uh, Michael O'Hanlon's uh, description of potential futures, it's a much more ambiguous future out there and a much more challenging one in, in many respects. In terms of similarities, uh, both armies exiting from what I, I believe the current conflicts have become fairly unpopular in this country. Shrinking budgets is a guaranteed 
there's a public aversion to uh, future military engagements. That's not always a bad thing. Uh, but there are some uh, similarities. Uh, the same mission, same institutional need to prepare for future conflicts. And like the Army of 1973, this Army is well equipped with a cadre of combat experienced leaders at all levels. Uh, this is a short list of what I think are some lessons out of history. Uh, some of them may be what we used to call blinding flashes of the obvious. Uh, it is complex. Innovations will come in many forms. It's not just weapons and technology. It's manning. It's doctrinal concepts and some things that I haven't categorized. Uh, they work best together. Uh, we're all, for, well, most of the U.S. Army is familiar with the DOT MLPF. That's one acronym I will not uh, describe. Uh, but the complexity of trying to get things in place. Uh, well, it is a complex world. Innovations must be integrated with other innovations to have their desired effect. To do this, you need collaboration. I uh, work in the Collaborative Analysis Center, which is a facility we have in my, uh, my organization. I can tell you collaboration is a heck of a lot harder than it looks. It's a heck of a lot harder to achieve. And, and uh, it's something that I think the Army needs to really work on. Uh, we need an innovation environment that, that uh, stimulates critical thinking, experimentation, uh, learning from experimentation. It was mentioned that there's been a great deal of uh, work with users in the field, in the combat theaters, learning what they need. Well, when those combat theaters go away, and we look forward to that day, where is your experimentation going to be then? Where will you learn what you can't learn because there's no battlefield? How will you prepare, such as at a national training center, a simulation environment, a training environment, where you'll actually learn whether your new doctrines and your new innovations work? Where is the objectivity and the measurements? It won't be a combat zone. It will be whatever environment we can come up with that comes close but doesn't get people hurt. And I would say the biggest challenge the Army faces in terms of innovation is continuity. And why do I say that? Well, the Army is not a small firm. It is not run by founders who will be in place for years. The Army is run by senior leaders who are very temporary in nature. Uh, the senior leaders at the front of the room in 10 years, those in uniform, will in all likelihood not be in uniform and the people in the back of the room will be at the front of the table. And having the continuity to both innovate and carry on innovation and improve on innovation is a major challenge that we face that probably other institutions, other commercial organizations don't. So I would say that's an enduring challenge. In TRADOC, General Depew started the ball rolling. Uh, General Starry followed, followed by General Otis, followed by General Richardson. And there was a innovation and continuity together. It was a splendid job on their part. And the leaders of today need to uh, pick up the torch and carry on.